Welcome to our AFA and Magna Wave webinar this evening. My name is Martha Jones, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Farriers Association. Uh, and my role this evening is really to turn it over to our expert that we are thrilled to have with us. Uh, a few months back, Jason Warwick with Matt, what, Magna Wave reached out to me to see if there were any collaboration opportunities with our farrier members. And uh, as part of that, they attended our annual convention last week in Tennessee and are bringing this free webinar uh, to the masses. So I'm very thrilled to have them. Uh, they are obviously leaders in, uh, in innovation, development, and education of it. So uh, thrilled to be able to offer everyone attending this evening this opportunity. And with that, I'd like to kick it over now to Jason. All right, guys. Sorry, just had a little trouble unmuting there. Uh, thanks, Martha, for uh, for the introduction. We're really excited to be here. Um, we have some experts on the phone. We have uh, Sean Rowe. He is a product specialist with MagnaWave. For those of you who were at the convention, hopefully you ran into Sean. Um, he was running the booth, doing the demos, and uh, spreading the good word about MagnaWave. We also have um, some other support staff here. We have Carson with education, and it looks like a few practitioners have also joined. So hopefully the chat will stay lively during this. Um, but the star of the show is uh, Carly Fedorka. She uh, is the, the lady who put this uh, study together. We partnered with her um, about a year ago, maybe even further and longer than that. Um, we've been working with her, but uh, this study came out over the summer about um, how PMF can affect the soul depth in equine. And Carly uh, earned her BS in biology from St. Lawrence University and her PhD in veterinary scientist, sciences from the University of Kentucky. Um, she's an expert in reproductive immunology and has focused her research on understanding the relationship between the immune system and the reproductive tract. Now, what's that mean for you and the soul depth and the, the farriers here in the audience who are wondering how what all that has to do with uh, the horse hoof health? Well, Carly's passion for thoroughbreds. Um, she is a manager of a commercial thoroughbred breeding farm in Lexington, and she this, this is a passion project of hers. So she utilizes this to solve industry-related problems and mentor the next generation of horse, horsemen and scientists. Uh, additionally, she continues to maintain a presence in the equine industry can, uh, by retaining countless off-the-track thoroughbreds whom she competes at upper levels of eventing. In her spare time, she enjoys fly fishing, spending time with her husband, and their Labrador, and cheering on the Buffalo Bills. So that was a big win with Josh Allen uh, taking it down Patrick Mahomes last weekend. So congratulations to you on that, Carly. And with that, I will pass to you. Um, for everyone else, you can drop your comments and questions in the chat. Martha and I will try to moderate those. And at the end, we'll do a little Q&A with Carly and both uh, both her and Sean to answer uh, study-related and machine PMF-related questions. Thank you, Jason, for the nice introduction. Um, so like Jason said, we recently published a paper on investigating whether or not uh, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy could improve soul depth. And today I'm just going to do a bit of a debriefing on why we came up with that idea, how we did the project and the data that we got from it. Um, like Jason said, though, I come to this project in a bit of an unconventional way. Uh, grew up a lifelong horseman, did 4-H, did pony club, kind of did the whole gamut. And then I went to college in upstate New York and obtained a degree in biology. And then I graduated college in the peak of the recession in 2008. So I moved to Lexington, Kentucky, was quickly employed as a groom on a thoroughbred breeding farm at Chesapeake Farm, and then just kind of climbed up the ranks in the thoroughbred breeding industry before I was eventually promoted to an assistant manager um, and sales director of Hinkle Farms out in Paris. 
Uh, in 2012, after uh, kind of a bad year for abortion and mares, I found myself somehow enrolled uh, at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky, and I obtained my PhD in veterinary sciences, and my field of research was specifically in reproductive immunology. So I've spent the last uh, 12 or 13 years trying to figure out what causes infectious causes of abortion and trying to find biomarkers to predict abortion. But where does that all tie into this? Throughout that time, while I was a poor, struggling graduate student, um, I was able to kind of make ends meet and pay for my own personal horses by retraining and selling off the track thoroughbreds, which you can see here. So we had our own facility. It was called Swickley Stables. Um, and we averaged anywhere between 30 and 40 a year. Uh, and it was just kind of a passion project that also allowed me to compete my own personal horses. And I'm sure uh, those of you that are horsemen or specifically farriers on this call, you can understand that although not all thoroughbreds have bad feet, there is definitely a transition phase off the track from where they go from, you know, 23 hours a day of being stabled to acclimating to turnout and also having um, a, a good enough quality foot that we can utilize them for sport purposes. So that is what kind of brought us to this idea. And I did just want to have this disclosure slash conflict of interest with the caveat of my doctorate is in equine reproduction. Um, I'm also a sponsored rider for MagnaWave. So they do provide me with the machines and the coils and the products. But at the end of the day today, I am not a veterinarian. I sure as heck am not a farrier. Um, and my really only specialty in the hoof is having owned what I consider to be a thousand of thoroughbreds. Um, this picture here was actually one of my amazing farriers in Lexington, Gage Morgan. And I can give a huge testimony to him as well as uh, the veterinarians that I worked with in Lexington, Dr. Heather Woodruff and Dr. Holly Schmidt, because what I'm gonna talk about today is the last 13 years of owning quite possibly the most poorly footed thoroughbred in the history of poor, th th poor footed thoroughbreds. So a bit of a background on the struggle that it is owning just that crappy footed horse. So in 2012, I acquired a horse named Dynamaker, royally, royally bred. He was by Empire Maker out of a Dynaformer mare named Dynamist. Um, he goes by the names Mackers, Mac Attack, or just the really crappy footed one. This is your classic horse that most farriers actually don't want to work with because no matter what we did, it didn't seem to work. So this horse retired from the racetrack at the age of three uh, with only three starts. So he definitely is not a war horse by any means. And quickly at the age of four until just this year, he had a pretty uh, pretty good sport horse career. He ran up through the levels and ended up at the prelim level, which is a meter 10. Um, but this horse just has terrible feet. So he definitely has that high-low syndrome where his right foot is incredibly compromised in comparison to the left foot. He has incredibly poor sole depth and he has uh, almost a negative Palmer angle. So we're not even at a 0% baseline. And what I'm going to do throughout this talk is kind of keep going back to this horse, Mac Attack, um, to explain why the improvement of soul depth is just so critically important to everybody that's dealing with these horses. So just starting with a debriefing of what is soul depth and why does it matter? And at the most basic of terminology, sole depth is just the distance from the distal apex of that third proximal phalanx. So the P3, or what we call the coffin bone seen here. I'm going to try to get a pointer out here. So it's the distance between the coffin bone to the ground surface. And it's incredibly important, though, to notice a few things, which is that we need to measure the distance to the surface. But if um, perhaps our horse is shod, the surface of that foot is going to be the shoe itself. So you can see here an actual image of Mac attack. In this case, we are measuring the distance from this P3, from this coffin bone, to the um, surface of the shoe itself. If the horse is unshod, we are measuring the distance of the P3 to the ground. And theoretically, what we are striving for is a measurement of at least 15 millimeters. Now, I will tell you guys that as I was drumming up all of these radiographs and pictures of Mac, 
Um, I did send a phone call to my veterinarian, Dr. Heather Woodruff, and we were just chatting of the headache that was Mac for the last 12 years. And I said to her, you know, so much of this is subjective. There really isn't uh, any research that shows that sole depth less than 15 millimeters is suddenly compromising. And most of our perception on this topic is based on uh, our horses that are struggling with laminitis. So knowing that if we reduce sole depth to the point of actually rupturing or puncturing the tip of that coffin bone through the, through to the ground, then we are obviously having a catastrophic issue. But there isn't any data that says that 15 is better than 10, five is worse than 10, et cetera. Although in the textbooks, we tend to strive for this minimum amount of 15 millimeters. The other thing to keep in mind when we are measuring sole depth is this idea of a cup. Theoretically, whether it is man-made or nature-made, there is a cupping of that wall of the hoof around um, the sole and eventually the frog. And this is going to appear as translucent um, with, within our radiographs due to that air pocket. So in the case of a cup, there's different strategies in measuring sole depth. Um, some practitioners or farriers will tell you that they don't care if the sole depth only reaches the cup. What their goal is, is to elevate that coffin bone off of the surface of the ground. And they will therefore consider the entire measurement of sole depth still to be the tip of that distal phalanx all the way to the ground surface. Others will argue that the cup doesn't actually offer much support and therefore the sole depth can only be measured from that distal phalanx to the tip of where that cup structure appears on radiography. And I will just give you guys the caveat that for our study, so many of these horses had pretty prominent cup structures, and therefore we chose to measure sole depth just to where that cup um, protruded within the x-ray and we did not measure all the way to the ground surface. So the other thing to keep in mind is that when we're measuring sole depth, it's a really good idea to measure both the apex of that distal phalanx, the toe, as well as the space between the digital cushions and either that cup structure or the surface of the ground, simply because that's going to give us a better idea of what our palmar angle is going to be. Um, which leads me to Palmer angle. So theoretically, an increase in sole depth at those digital cushions will correspond with a positive angle of that P3 or coffin bone. Um, and again, the subjective idea being that the ideal Palmer angle is roughly between three and five degrees relative to the ground. And here is where that cup structure doesn't matter as much because we're simply looking at the angle or tilt of that P3. And in this case, you can see in this radiograph, this horse has a pretty prominent angle. So while with sole depth, there's not too much of an ideology of too much is not good, um, you know, more is better. In the case of Palmer angle, we definitely don't want too dramatic of angling because that is when the, we do end up um, increasing our chances of a laminitic episode. So in this case, a horse having a seven degree angle is not less than ideal, or it's not ideal, it would be considered less than ideal. The other thing to keep in mind is that we don't know a ton about soul depth and perhaps me coming in as just a scientist and not somebody that has a whole ton of anecdote or clinical impression might be the best one to do the debriefing because I really just did a deep dive into the literature to see what had been published on this topic. You know, we hear a ton of wives tales. Um, I'm sitting here preaching to you guys and I'm going to give you a talk about the shitty footed thoroughbred, but we all know that yes, breed may influence, uh, whether or not we are going to struggle with poor soul depth, but there definitely isn't an end all be all like case in point, thoroughbreds do not always have poorer or lesser soul depth than that of our quarter horse breed, our draft breeds or our warm bloods, but breed can have an impact. The other thing that we've seen is that nutrition is going to have an impact, how we feed these horses, the amount of concentrate or the percentage of protein within their hay. 
We've also seen injury, in this case being laminitis or just having even um, something as considerable as having a fracture on the off leg potentially will shift the weight onto the good or decent footed uh, side. And you will see decreases of that sole depth on the compromised or compensating leg. And last but certainly not least is surface exposure. How often these horses are on soft surfaces versus hard surfaces, um, and whether or not that is in a field or even in a stall setting, I think we can all agree that when we have our horses stalled for long periods of time, we actually tend to see decreased soil depth. So in that deep dive on the literature, I just wanted to pull up some of the key studies that have been done. This one's pretty old, but they ended up investigating if there was a difference in soul depth between different populations. So they looked at feral horses, both in a soft surface, um, AKA sand, or in a hard surface. So the hard surface feral horses are in the black bar. The feral horses that were on sandy surface are in the very light gray bar. And they compared the soul depth of those two populations to thoroughbreds that were in a normal routine and domesticated. And you can see here, they not only saw an influence of breed, not surprisingly, with that perception that the thoroughbred ten, uh, had significant decreased soul depth in comparison to any feral horse population. But when you looked at the two different feral horse populations, those of which that were on hard surface compared to those of which which were on sandy surface, we actually see increased soul depth in the animals that are on hard surface, almost as if that hoof creates a callus due to the hard surface and allows that soul depth to increase to raise that P3 off the ground even further. Whereas with our sandy surface um, animals or animals that are exposed to sandy surface, we never quite see that callus form. Going back to Mac, he kind of ticked a couple of our not great uh, correlations with poor soul depth. This is again, another uh, radiograph of this horse. So for those of you that are attuned to reading radiographs, you can understand why this horse was such a struggle for us. First and foremost, he is of the breed that tends to be uh, most commonly associated with this problem. So he was 100% thoroughbred. He received good nutrition, so I do not think that nutrition had a huge role in this problem. Um, he received hallway distinguished, which is a senior feed uh, that is high protein, high uh, fat, and he also received really good hay quality. This horse did not have injuries that we are, were aware of. In fact, he has pretty darn pristine x-rays, so there was no compensation due to injury on that poor foot, on that right foot. And theoretically surface exposure, um, he was exposed to hard ground. I'm sure we can all imagine that on those more drought-like years in Lexington, Kentucky, he was turned out 16 hours a day and then stabled the other eight. So except for the 30 to 45 minutes in which he was ridden in synthetic footing or sand footing, he was mostly exposed to hard surfaces. So besides the breed, theoretically, there weren't many other contributing factors that would make you point at this horse and say, oh, he's going to be one that we struggle with. Also, though, we, we can reach for a variety of therapeutics that we think are going to, quote unquote, fix this problem. But we have to keep in mind that very few of the therapeutic options that we have are actually going to fix the problem, but rather mitigate the impact of the problem. So we can treat these animals with systemic non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We can um, do intraarticular injections within that coffin joint. And obviously, you know, you guys in this talk all know we tend to run towards uh, podiatry interventions, whether that is through an actual podiatrist or utilizing the knowledge base of our farrier, um, that is obviously up to the client. Uh, with that being said, like I said, there are very few treatments that have actually been assessed to evaluate the efficacy and in actually increasing soul depth. Um, I'm sure everybody on this call is aware of biotin. It was one of the first things I reached for for this horse, but now having uh, prepped for this talk and this uh, paper that was published, I've realized there's actually not a ton of data to actually support the use of biotin. So this is one of the first studies that was published on biotin. And unfortunately they did not look specifically at soul depth, but they did look at hoof growth and hoof hardness. 
And just to orient you guys to the graph a little bit, um, they looked at a variety of different treatments. So group A, which is just kind of the dashed line with no real uh, bullet on the data, that is the control group. Group B, which is the one with the tiny asterisks, that was animals that were fed 15 milligrams of biotin daily. Group C was uh, fed half that dose, so 7.5 milligrams daily. And group D was fed 15 milligrams daily, but on alternating months. More importantly than breaking all of that down, I hope you guys can see that there was no significant difference between our control groups that were fed no biotin in comparison to those that were fed biotin. Um, although there was, when looking at hoof hardness, theoretically an increase overall in the fall months. So between September and uh, late December, we actually saw the hoof get harder. Not surprising um, during our fall season. A more recent study did not specifically look at biotin, but it did look at a product that has biotin within it called Linpro. Um, this is a supplement that is available throughout the country. And this supplement uh, contains 17.4 mg per ounce. An ounce is what they tend to top dress feed with, alongside omega-3 fatty acids and a variety of vitamins and minerals. So again, not specifically isolating biotin itself, but more so looking at a product that is for overall coat and hoof health. And what they saw in this study, again, not specifically measuring sole depth, but more so hoof growth, um, they did see an improvement in the animals that were supplemented with Linpro, both in total hoof growth, as well as when they looked at hoof growth over specifically um, an eight week course. So something promising in the works, but again, not specifically pinpointing to biotin itself. Back to Mackers, um, you can imagine a horse competing at this level, we kind of threw the board at him. So was he on non anti-inflammatories? You betcha. This horse did receive the standard dose of Equiox every day. Did he get his coffins injected? Every single year, he had those distal interphalangeal injections, um, and it would usually include hyaluronic acid as well as some antibiotics and triamcinolone for inflammation. Was he on biotin? Well, I'm also sponsored by Equithrive, so every single day, this animal received 12 grams of biotin orally. And then when it got down to whether or not we tried to help him with both podiatry as well as our regular farrier, you betcha. So we originally started this horse with just a simple frog support pad, usually a McLean alongside some steel, just to get uh, that frog off the ground. And this horse theoretically didn't tolerate a ton of frog pressure. Um, his collapsed hoof tended to coincide with some central sulcus thrush, and that tended to actually be almost more painful than when we left him barefoot. We also tried polyflex with a, um, a very thin pour in or very soft pour in pad with it, and then ended up with the good old Sycophus with a pour in as well. Um, on the top right, you can actually see a kind of temp medicine pad that I was able to take in and out because he was obviously also suffering from an abscess at this time. Interestingly, uh, and just for those of you in the room, what he is in recently is a Versa grip. Um, and that has been pretty great for him. We're able to put that wedge insert into the Versa grip and he doesn't have to have a ton of frog pressure on top of that. So he's done really well with that in the last few years, albeit competing at a lower level. Um, and why is this so important? Well, if I could look at my bank account, I would tell you why it's so important, but I also found it funny and interesting that I found this picture because I decided to write a, write a Facebook status of how frustrating this horse was. Um, theoretically, any time that we don't have proper protection of the coffin uh, bone or joint, it's going to be associated with lameness. Uh, worst case scenario, it's going to be just general bruising of all of the structures of the hoof. But theoretically, we're also not offering protection to any of the surfaces that the horse is on, which is going to lead to an increased risk of abscessing. And with all of these things, bruising, abscessing, lameness, we're going to have reduced training time. And in my specific situation, that's also going to coincide with 
sending Hail Marys into the world of entering horse shows for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars and having your horse go lame the day before you ship out. So the impact financially is considerable with these horses. Um, And it's not just in the case of how much it costs to treat your horse with Equiox or how much those Sikafus cost, but it's all of the uh, external and more umbrellaed finances that go alongside these horses. So that leads me to PEMF. And I did want to add a bit of a caveat here. Um, All of us work in the horse industry, so all of us know crazy horse people. I will tell you guys right now that although I am a sponsored rider by MagnaWave, I am not a diehard run for the hills screaming its praises type of person. I am a scientist first and foremost, and I was the first person when this uh, therapeutic came out to go, yeah, show me the data. This is great. This is awesome. It's incredibly expensive. Somebody please show me the data. And I have decided in the last couple of years to publish my way into either proving or disproving my belief in this product. And I hope that this um, that this data can be presented to you in literally the most non-biased way possible. Because if you are a believer, awesome. This data is exciting. If you're a non-believer, hopefully I can explain to you where we are at with our knowledge base on this product and also where it needs to go down the road. So quite simply, uh, PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, is a non-invasive therapeutic that is going to apply intermittent pulses through a magnetic field directly to tissue. And it's going to utilize pulse repetition as well as frequency. And theoretically, you can control both the power of the pulse as well as the frequency of the pulse. And obviously, probably not the best way to show this with a hoof, but I did want those of you that haven't seen um, PEMF be utilized to see just what, see if I can click over to this, just what it does to a tissue. So you can see those repeated pulses being administered to the neck of this horse. Um, And just being able to visualize what that looks like onto a tissue. This is actually Max's little brother, JJ, and he is more uh, having issues with his lower neck than his feet. So how is this actually going to influence tissue? Um, I did a deep dive in the last few weeks, and theoretically, we're going to be able to influence tissue in two ways by applying this pulsed electromagnetic field therapy to it. First and foremost, the magnetic field is going to create force on tissue, and that's actually going to be able to manipulate or move any of these signaling pathways that are dependent on reactive properties. And that's going to include our reactive oxygen species, also known as ROS, or our nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a smooth muscle relaxer. So by moving this uh, enzyme throughout tissue, we're able to manipulate how that muscle is contracting. The other way in which uh, PEMF has been found to alter tissue is by inducing an electrical force. So go back to your high school chemistry class. And I think we can all remember that so many of our electrolytes, for better term, calcium, um, phosphorus, for a sodium are going to maintain a charge on them. And therefore, hemp is able to actually take those charged um, properties and move them through or within cells to have downstream uh, impacts. And this is where the scientist in me geeks out a little bit. And I promise you guys that this will be our only intensive scientific slide. But it took me kind of wrapping my mind around this to, as a scientist, get a little bit excited that there is some data to support the use of this product. So a couple of things that we do know. We do know that PEMF moves calcium around. And we also know that by moving that positively charged calcium, we are able to actually increase the binding of it to to its counterpart, calcium calmodulin. Now, calcium calmodulin is able to bind to and activate what's called INOS. And INOS is the enzyme that controls nitric oxide. And like I just said, nitric oxide is that smooth muscle relaxer. So it's manipulating how muscles contract. And we also know that when we 
activate nitric oxide, we actually can alter phosphorylation of various of our energy sources, including um, cyclic GMP. Now, by activating cyclic GMP, we actually are able to turn on a variety of secondary messengers that dramatically impact biological functions. So in this figure, we see that we're activating VEGF. And VEGF is incredibly important in not only developing, but also stimulating blood supply. It's going to activate tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that's going to help with immune response to various uh, stimulants of it, whether that's pathogens like bacteria or viruses, or just simple response to inflammation. And then we're also going to increase um, transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta. And TGF beta is really essential in kind of controlling overall immunity. So we don't just want the immune system to respond, but we also want to keep our immune system happy. I'm sure that those of you that struggle with autoimmune disorders understand that we don't always need our immune system ramped up. We also need it to quiet down at times. And that is what TGF beta does. So what do we know about this product clinically? And we have to always go back to what do we know about it in the human? Because like I said, there's not a ton of research on it in the horse. And I am the first person to tell you that what works in the human doesn't always work in the horse. Otherwise, I would not be employed. So in the human, we know that PEMF is clinically being utilized mostly for orthopedics. So it's been found to regenerate bones after fracture. It's also been found to reduce the symptoms of osteoarthritis. Again, going back to that immune system. So if we can kind of suppress that immunity, we can then decrease the inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Interestingly, it's also being used in the neurology field. So specifically with things like depression, even things like autism, um, and it's being used for oncology in the treatment of cancer. Again, all of these, um, most of these cancers are going to be influenced by cell signaling. And if you can influence that calcium channel signaling, you're going to be able to influence cancer. And last but certainly not least is wound healing. So being able to apply these uh, coils to things like skin grafts or even just wounds that just won't heal pro uh, properly, this is being used quite often in human medicine. But we're all here because of the horse. So I just want to quickly run through the six studies that have actually been done in the horse. A lot of it is quite comparable to that of the human. So 30 years ago, there was already a study published on the use of PEMF to improve bone graft formation in the horse. Um, and that was quickly followed just a few years later by a study where they showed that it improved the process of bone repair. So again, when things are fractured and those really stupid osteoclasts and osteoblasts are just laying bone down, PEMF can stimulate that. We also saw in 93, a similar thing where we were actually stimulating a very key phase of that bone repair. Now, it seems like it was dropped for 20 some years um, because it wasn't until 2014 that we started to see some new research come out and a lot of it wasn't that positive. Uh, first and foremost, we saw that PEMF did not improve back pain in polo ponies. I'll add you guys a caveat on this study. They didn't actually like radiograph these animals, um, nor did they really describe how they were exercised. So I think that that study had quite a few co-variables in it. By 2015, we saw in an in vitro study that we actually could force these mesenchymal stem cells that were theoretically going to inject into the joints of the horses uh, to be a bit more active. So to produce collagen, and then just recently, another study looked at the use of PEMF um, on clinically sound animals. So I won't get too much into that one because I'll say I'm not sure what we were expecting to improve when the animals were already doing just fine. But they did show that PEMF did lower the heart rate, um, theorizing that it potentially was uh, able to kind of eliminate stress in the animals around them. So... A couple of years ago, uh, having known almost nothing about this, I, like I said, I owned my own farm and I staffed this farm with a variety of equine science students at the local universities. And this one, Maddie, 
um, was really an exceptional kid. And she was a senior at Midway. And she approached me and said that she needed to do a senior capstone project. And because of the fact that she just happened to work for a scientist, she wanted to know if I would help her. And I said to her, like, I will help you with a study as long as we do it the right way. We're not going to, you know, throw some CBD on some horse's grain and see if they crib less. Like, that's not how we do research. So I said to her that if we would actually do it the correct way, and it would theoretically be able to be at least made into an abstract that she could present somewhere, I would help her. And she said, well, we have that MagnaWave machine. Do you think we could do some research on MagnaWave? And I said, yeah, I guess theoretically we would need enough horses. We would need to control for other things. And we would need to do it in a way where it's clinically relevant to the industry. So she came up with the idea that we would investigate if repeated administration of high frequency PEMP treatment would improve soul depth. And because of my life schedule, it had to be done in 30 days. So this is what we did for this project. We wanted to investigate if we could improve soul depth after applying PEMF multiple times a week. To do so, we initially started by trimming all of the horses so that there was no podiatry intervention throughout those 30 days. And then we were really lucky to be assisted by a local practitioner named Dr. David Alexander at Rudin Riddle, and he agreed to take lateral medial shots on 10 horses. So in these lateral medial shots, we measured sole depth, heel depth, as well as palmar angle. And then we divided these animals into two groups, six of which were treated and four of which were in the control. And we tried to group them based on having equal numbers of animals with bad soul depth versus good, as well as um, controlling for breed. So warm blood versus thoroughbred, um, as well as gelding versus mare. Following this, we took six of those horses and they were treated with high frequency PEMF Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 10 minutes a session. And that consisted of 22 Hertz on the hoof mat for those 10 minutes. And the machine that we used was the Julian Duo. Um, for those of you that have a hard time converting Hertz to power, we literally set it at the highest power <laughs> that this machine will do. And we, we chose that because all of the horses tolerated that. Now, like I said, during this 30 days, none of the animals had any farrier intervention and they were all maintained on the same nutrition, exercise and turnout schedule. And then at that 30 day mark, we, put, we took our post-treatment lateral medial radiographs and again measured the toe, the heel and the palmar ankle. So this is what our animals looked like. Um, we chose these 10 animals because they were the ones that weren't for sale and were going to exist on this farm for the entirety of the 30 days. But you can see here, we did have two warm bloods out of the 10 animals. So we made sure that one of those warm bloods was in our control group and the other was in our PEMF group. We also did um, have animals that did not have symmetric hoofs. So they, quite a few of our animals, specifically two out of four in the control group and three out of six in the treated group were asymmetric um, at the onset of the study. And we also grouped them with one out of four in the control group and three out of six in the treated group as starting the study with poor soul depth. And then two out of four of our control animals and four of six in our treated animals have poor palmar angle. Um, and we classified those things as less than 12 millimeters for soul depth and less than three degrees for our poor palmar angle. So to start, our animals were equal at the onset of this study. So if you look at the um, soul depth in millimeters of our control animals to start the study, it was the same as the animals that were in the treated group. And this was noted at both the heel and the toe. So just to uh, kind of orient yourself here, this is the median of our soul depth. These are our interquartile ranges. You can see that there was a decent a bit of variability in our heel group, but much less when we looked at toe. But theoretically, our animals started with quite decent soul depth 
overall in both the heel and the toe. When we looked at the influence of treatment at the end of the study, we did not see a significant impact on either the left toe or the left heel. So again, you can see here, um, just to orient your guys' brains to these graphs, we ended up looking at the change in depth. So we actually took the individual animal and what their, um, in this case, let's say left toe measured at the end of the treatment uh, phase and compared it to the beginning of the treatment phase, as some of these animals started with sole depth that was five millimeters and some started with over 20. So we ended up normalizing it to the animal itself. And you can see here, there's no significant difference in the left toe or the left heel when we evaluated the influence of PEMF. Again, we did not see a significant improvement on the right toe. Um, but what was kind of fascinating is that we did see a trend towards a significant increase in the right heel. So when I say significance, we tend to set our p-value as anything less than 0 0.05, which means that there's a 95% chance that it's repeatable. When I say a trend, I usually set my p-value to 0 0.1, which means that there's a 90% chance of this being repeatable. And with this p-value of 0 0.06, it means that there's a 94% chance of this being repeatable. So with a 94% chance of it being repeatable, we did see this increase in the sole depth specifically of the right heel. Now, interestingly, you would think that if we're increasing the heel without increasing the sole depth of the toe, that we would see a positive um, change on Palmer angle, but we did not see that overall. Um, and this could be for a variety of reasons, but again, like I told you, so many of these animals started the study with pretty darn good feet. So we did theoretically, um, kind of hypothesize, this is probably something that's only going to really make improvements on feet that can be or should be improved. And that kind of leads me to this specific case. So this was a horse on the study. Um, his name was John B. He was actually one of our, he was a rescue, to be brutally honest. We got him out of a kill pen in Texas. And you can see on the left side, when we measured this horse uh, pre-treatment, we saw that he only had about 10 millimeters of sole depth at the toe, but he did have a good Palmer angle um, because he had about 20 millimeters of sole depth uh, under those digital cushions. And you can see this horse really, really, really improved. And I can let Maddie weigh in at the end of this talk. This horse was pretty darn crippled when we started this study. And you can see in the post-treatment images, well, first of all, you can see this pretty nasty abscess <laughs> under his toe, but he improved five millimeters of sole depth under the toe and six millimeters of sole depth under the heel. And he started the study very clinically lame and he ended the study pretty darn sound. In fact, we were able to get on him and get going with his retraining. So this is kind of where we left with this study of, um, is this data earth shattering? Absolutely not. But we saw that multiple PEMF treatments over the course of 30 days did tend to improve sole depth, specifically of the right heel. And that unfortunately did not correspond with any change in Palmer angle. But I always tell people that when we're doing research like this, any change in this small number of animals that we observed, you know, in only an N of six needs to be heated. So does it mean that you guys should all run out and buy MagnaWave machines right now and get going? Sure, if you want to. But theoretically, what it means is that future research is needed on this topic. And if I had a bajillion dollars and all of the research animals in the world, there's a couple of key things I would look at. First and foremost, the power of treatment. Um, like I said, it's not always that if something is good, more is better. So potentially if we did this treatment more often, say daily, but at a lower power, would we actually see a better response, a poorer response? I don't know. We only tested one treatment and we only treated the animals Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The multitude of treatment. So again, if we increased that to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, would we actually see a better response? 
And the frequency of treatment. What if we did this twice a day? What if we did this less than three times a week? Would we have still seen this trend towards a significant improvement um, had we only done it once a week? And even more importantly, maybe we need to do this for more than 30 days. Perhaps it needs to be 60 or 90. I can tell you as the person that owned Mac Attack from the age of four, and he's turning 17, um, if you had told me that if I had just done this every day for 90 days, yeah, I probably would have ran and bought a machine because theoretically I have well over the cost of one of these machines into this horse in just shoeing pills. So with that, um, I do want to thank the amazing people that helped me with this study. This We called us ourselves the dream team. So this is myself, Dr. Alexander, and Maddie. Um, and you guys can tell we did this study in February. So Maddie got to stand out there and Magna Wave six horses on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays all by her lonesome self. Um, and I also want to thank Rudin Riddle for allowing Dr. Alexander to be a part of the study, MagnaWave for supporting us with the machine and all of the coils, and then obviously Midway University, because without them forcing their seniors to do a senior capstone, we wouldn't have this data available to all of you. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. All right. Thank you, Carly. That was awesome. Um, so glad that you took the time to present that. We do have a few questions that are following into the chat. And again, those of you who are listening, feel free to just drop them in the chat. Um, and Martha, if you could um, unmute Sean Rowe as well, our Magnoid specialist, um, I will start kind of going through, through these. Um, one person, Alyssa, you mentioned the kissing spine. Um, yes, we have seen positive impact on that. And I will say we're doing another study, but since this is the Farriers Association, we'll stock, we'll, we'll stick to what um, Carly knows and, and stay on this, but stay tuned for maybe mid 2025 for the publication on that. Um, and I, I can, I can do a quick way in. I have not used it on an animal with kissing spines. I've been really, really, really fortunate to not, uh, I'm like of the 20% that own thoroughbreds that doesn't have to experience that. But the, the horse that I did show the video of, he has pretty significant arthritis between his C3 and his C6 of his lower neck. And I, I like I said, I am not the biggest ambassador for the equipment, but I will tell you that before every international event I take him to, that horse gets magna waved on his lower neck every day for probably three months prior to it. And it's only anecdote, but he really, really, really enjoys that treatment. And I do think that it helps with the arthritis of his lower neck. No, that's, that's awesome. Much appreciated. Uh, Sean, this one's for you. Um, when using PMF, do you think it matters if you're using analog or digital? Yeah, well, based on the st uh, study criteria, it was a maximum power on a machine that was an analog machine at 8,300 gauss. So to have an equivalent, um, um, reproduction of the study, you would do a digital machine such as our Maya Pro at the same power level. Then I see another question come in about uh, somebody having a Soul Pro machine, which is a 6,000 Gauss machine. So really the difference, what you would do uh, to put the same amount of power into the hoof that was utilized in this study is instead of 10 minutes, you'd be about 13 to 14 minutes, probably 14 minutes to put that same amount of power in. So that's how you make up with uh, power on our devices of, is time of session. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you Renee uh, asked if we're going to continue research on this. And yes, yes, we are. Um, I know Carly has been talking about continuing research on this. And that is one of our big missions um, going into 2025 is to continue the study on the science. Um, just a little bit about MagnaWave. We also have an FDA cleared line of machines, uh, the Nova HD Plus through Orwell. Um, and so with that, we've been doing a lot of research on humans and that has inspired us to do the same on equine as well as um, livestock, et cetera. But again, we'll kind of get back to the, the theme of this. I know we got a lot of practitioners in here who are MagnaWave specific too, and they wanted to get you know, caught up on the study as well. So I appreciate that. But yes, we are really putting an emphasis on studies and education um, going forward. So having partners like Carly, as well as others across the nation has been huge for us. 
Um, I someone do see that used my link to sign in asked about the semi ten. Uh, right. Sorry about that. some of you all that showed up as Jason Warwick's on here. I posted the la the wrong link at the last minute there whenever I was sharing uh, on the certified practitioner group. So if you click that one, you showed up as me. I apologize, but yeah, on the semi ten. It would be about double the time. Am I right, Sean? Yeah, that's correct. Basically, you're talking about a 4,700 Gauss machine. Uh, you're probably going to be a, a 20 minute session versus a 10 minute session uh, with the Julian. And and Carly, I saw in the pictures, maybe you used our mag energy mat with the, the hoof guard, the hoof plate that we use. Um, someone asked, would it be different if we used um, the butterfly versus standing on the box? or, um, you know, or does it matter? Yeah, I actually just saw that question. I think it's a great question. Um, and I know that Maddie and I had actually chatted about that a bit, uh, because even at the highest power setting with that machine, when her and I as humans stood on that mat, you know, in our boots, we couldn't feel much. And theoretically, if you would put that small butterfly coil around the coronet band, you could definitely get uh, the, the, the power and the frequency up quite a bit to that coronet. And I think we all know here on this group that the growth is coming <laughs> from the coronet. Uh, so I think that that'd be a great thing to study to actually compare the two. Unfortunately, I can't make a huge bit of inference, but I will tell you guys that as somebody who's used this to help with abscesses, I am much more likely to put that small uh, loop around the coronet to help with that versus having them stand on the mat. Yeah, and DL Hall mentions um, the study being done with a, a Julian duo at level 20. Um, it was a duo that you were using, correct? Yes, Which is yeah, it was a Julian the, duo. Same as the Julian, same same machine, just the duo having the two independent controlled machines. Um, we've got questions about um, about the, the timeline there from Melissa. Do you think doing PMF daily or three times a week would theoretically help improve a two-year-old cult with juvenile arthritis? Trying to avoid surgery and have already done pro-stride pro treatment and just wondering what would be a good protocol. Have the Julian machine. So we actually, this is off this topic, um, but to support what our lovely people at MagnaWave are saying, they actually just recently allowed us at CSU to do a study on the impact of uh, PEMF treatment on osteoarthritis. It was not juvenile arthritis by any means. These were aged polo ponies. Um, we definitely saw a reduction in lameness grade but we still, we actually have quite a bit of blood samples uh, in the freezer that we're gonna analyze for the actual inflammatory uh, cytokines to see if it actually functioned as anti-inflammatory. So long story short, I don't think we know if it's gonna help your animal with juvenile arthritis, but I think that we know that we're at least reducing the pain that is being caused by the juvenile arthritis. So are we slowing down the arthritic process? absolutely no clue, but potentially reducing some of those pain mechanisms associated with it. Great. And uh, Renee uh, just reiterated that uh, she's had better luck with the butterfly loop on, on the hoof. So maybe if we do a phase two of this, we <laughs> um, experiment with, with the different attachments and Sean, if you wanted to to chime in there on the, the different attachments that would be no I, I definitely I definitely agree I mean the, the thing with the the hoof mat that you used uh, it's more of just convenience and, and, and time you know necessity so if you were to use a, a a a zoom box with a zoom paddle you're going to have a more concentrated effect than you would with that mag energy mat and that uh, mag energy guard uh, and a lot of it has to do with speed and ease of use so I would think that if you concentrate with the butterfly loop or the zoom paddle and the and the zoom box you would uh, you're going to have a little bit longer session, but you're going to have more concentrated delivery. And I'd love to see some more questions from the farriers in the group. They're not all MagnaWave practitioners that, that joined to watch Carly here today. I know that. Um, let's see. And sorry to the, the person who just posted about the Pulse Pro. You also used my link, so I apologize again. <laughs> um, but you have a Pulse Pro, work full-time on a local equine rescue uh laminitis uh talked to the farrier yesterday and he's just learning about it through you um i i think the answer to that's definitely yes it would help yeah i i would think so as well um 
I we're still open for questions. We have a few minutes left, guys. Um, we really, really appreciate your time, Carly. I know you're a busy, busy lady between all the horses and all the studying and the work. Uh, the nine to five is just a part of it. Um, <laughs> so we definitely appreciate you taking out some time today. Um, how often would you recommend doing sessions on the hooves, Carly? Uh, yeah, I don't see, um, at least for this, this specific, uh, project, I don't see that you could ever do it too much. Um, I think that that's one of the things that Maddie and I also discussed is, you know, we were trying to minimize how much time she was spending her senior year, but I theoretically would probably have my horse standing in that coil or on that mat, as long as he would tolerate standing in the cross ties. And we had quite a few horses that just zonked out and probably would have stood there for 60 minutes. Um, so theoretically, if your horse will tolerate that, I don't think you're damaging the hoof by any means by adding a bit more time. And I don't think you're damaging the horse if you did it daily. Um, you know, just make sure you have a fridge with some beer in your barn. If you're going to do it multiple times a day for an hour at a time and <laughs> crack open a cold beer and sit there with your horse. <laughs> right. I mean, a lot of the times we'll say treat as often as necessary to get the desired results and then as often as necessary to maintain those results. I know that uh, a question just came in from Abby Alexander. Would you use a level 20 on the Julian duo with a butterfly loop? I would do as much as the animal could tolerate. If the, if the animal is comfortable, uh, especially in the hoof area, any area of little to no soft tissue, they can take a lot of power. It's not like you're working the top line of the animal. Yeah. And I guess it would also, you know, we, I didn't really mention the fact that I think more of us are becoming aware of poor Palmer angle of the hind feet. Um, I think they're going to tolerate that on their front feet quite well. And I think that you need to be a little bit careful putting anything of high power on the hind feet until you have your horse like acclimate, acclimated to that high power. But just like he said, we, we chose that power because that's how I was taught, you know, as the reproductive physiologist of set it to a power the horse tolerates. Um, and they let you know pretty, pretty darn quickly what they don't tolerate. And, and, yeah, and, and in this test group, did you, you had every animal was at a very comfortable level, I assume. That is yeah. All and, and honestly, I think we could have gone up if the machine would have done more. Right. Um, yeah, I, they were all pretty happy. <laughs> and theoretically, I mean, you are going to go up if you're using that butterfly or that zoom paddle. Yes, versus for sure. Yeah, so. I think a level 20 might actually make a horse jump off the ground on the small butterfly. <laughs> very well could. It very, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, Sean. Um, Lisa asked if the farriers will have this. Yes. Uh, Martha, I'm sure we'll share this recording. It's all been recorded. Um, so the American Farriers Association, I'm sure we'll be sharing. MagnaWave will definitely be sharing. We'll be cutting some of this up. Carly, you dropped a lot of good gems. I had some notes to where I kind of time step things for us uh, on our team to use as well for good, um, good little um, sound bites to use in the in the future. Um, Matt Scruggs asked in, in the test group how many horses responded positively um, compared to the control. So I know you know your six was a lump sum, yep. but do you have a number there? Yeah, it's actually funny that you asked that because I, I remade all of my graphs before giving this talk today because they came up a little bit blurry taking from my paper. And I went back through that data to look at it and three of the six um, responded positively. And two of those three started with, like two of those three started with poor soul depth. And one of the three started with good soul depth, but had responded really positively. Um, the other animal that started with poor soul depth, it just didn't really respond. Like it, he, that animal just kind of maintained, it was basically just a zero. And then two of the animals, um, that started with good soul depth actually ended the study with a little bit less soul depth, which theoretically makes sense, right? It's February in Kentucky, we're having ice storms and they're wearing their foot down a bit. Um, so yeah, so it was impressive. Uh, funny enough, Mac, the one that I talked about this whole time, he's the one that did not respond to the treatment. So I think it just kind of goes <laughs> to tell us that maybe that horse should just not be ready. No help. <laughs> no help for him. <laughs> um, and then uh, we had a question about, um, you know, often is being obviously great, but practically 
you know, what would the minimum per week to achieve any kind of results? I'll let whoever, uh, Sean or Carly. Yeah, I can, I can weigh in on this a little bit. Um, I think it depends on how much effort you want to put forth, but I know that based on this data, um, we started theoretically tacking up and grooming our horses while they stood on the mat. So that, um, in my barn took anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, you know, five to six days a week. And the ones that we were worried about are the, the horse that I showed you, the pre and post that's John B the Mac, my FEI horse, uh, the mat just kind of ended up living in our grooming stall. And theoretically, you know, you put them on it while you're grooming and tacking, you put them on it while you're untacking or drying off from a bath. And you'd be amazed at how much time you can get them on that mat. Well, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's the big advantage to the mat. It is a big time. Yes. Saver. Uh, so, you know, if you have the ability to do so, you're going to build, you think if you're going to spend 10 minutes on one hoof and 10 minutes on the other, 10 minutes together on, on one unit is, is a little bit more palatable for time. Yeah. And it, and it's safer, right? You attach them to a butterfly coil or to that small loop and they, they flip out in the cross ties and suddenly your machine's getting, you know, sent across the aisle way versus they step off the mat while you're, you know, brushing your hair and it's not that noticeable. Yeah. And for anybody listening, you know, we do have a Black uh, Friday special coming up that really tackles this this mat combo. Uh, so uh, be be on alert for that uh, with any machine that uh, you purchase any package, you can add on uh, basically a two thousand dollar package for half price, uh, which really will speed your time up. I mean, that mat and that that guard is is a big time saver and you can uh, do it safely and, and in a short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Sean, I appreciate that. Uh, wasn't going to let you get off of here without uh, pitching our promotion there. Um, you know, I, I know Carly's here for the science, but that's why we brought you on for anyone interested. We have lots of options. Um, all of our machines um, are going to include that any machine you buy for the thousand um, dollars. And for the farriers in the audience, um, you know, we, we have the higher powered machines. They, we also have the Spiro click that um, has saddlebags that are kind of hands-free that, may have some relaxation effects um, for the horses while you're working on them as well. Um, some of what Carly mentioned in her kind of prequel to getting into the study as far as the de-stressing and the release that you see on the horses. So we have uh, you know a wide array of machines available at different price points and Sean would be your guy if you had any questions on that. For yeah, sure. I went ahead and put a link to my calendar and my uh, email in the thread. Also, uh, a good resource, uh, Daisy was at the, uh, uh, way more, it was at the show, uh, the Farrier's Convention. She uh, is uh, very knowledgeable as well. Feel free to uh, reach out to her. I think her comment was at the top with her contact information. Yeah, absolutely. She is a full-time farrier and has a magnet wave machine. Yeah, so anybody right? wants to have a farrier peer-to-peer, -peer, Daisy's a great person to reach out to. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So Daisy, thank you so much for for joining the talk today. I hope everybody learned a bunch. Um, I think the questions have kind of slowed down. Um, we Matt Scruggs bought one eight weeks ago and jumped into treating. So congratulations on that. Um, if if we don't have any more questions, yeah. wherever Tom Carly, anything else? No, I just I did see a question come in of did you use different levels for each horse and how did you manage that variable in your conclusion? We did not. We we set that power threshold to what the wimpiest horse would tolerate. So theoretically, um, some of the horses potentially could have or would have tolerated a higher power, but we chose that setting based on what the wimpiest horse would tolerate. And just for those of you that are into science or into research, um, a great question, because that's something definitely that you want to consider in experimental design. And that is kind of how we're formulating our future research questions as well. So in the case of the osteoarthritis uh, study, we used the small butterfly and we set it at two because that was what our wimpiest horse would tolerate. So, you know, that's definitely something to consider if you don't see some horses progress, like maybe Mac needs more stimulus to his foot to actually get this to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of variables involved with with the technology because there's there's not a, a set um, guideline on each. Each animal is going to be a little bit different. So. And, and yeah, and one last question, Carly, I, I've seen it. I think I saw it, maybe saw it more than once is just the um, not seeing uniform gr growth across the hoofs. Um, you know, do you have an hypothesis on that? I know you kind of mentioned that at the end, um, some things, yeah. but 
Yeah, we definitely, um, again, you, y'all, the, you foot people are weird because there is very little, uh, data and research that is published on what you guys love the most. Um, but we do know in peer reviewed papers that most horses are going to have some asymmetry. So, uh, I think more than half of our equine population is going to have a high low type issue. So our, our theory was that it tended to be that collapsed hoof that improved the most. And theoretically that is the hoof we are the most worried about. Um, so I don't think that we can treat every, uh, horse as itself. I think we have to treat every hoof as its own entity. Um, and theoretically we're going to improve the ones that need improvement. Um, like I said earlier, if your horse already has 20 millimeters of sole depth and that perfect five degree Palmer angle probably isn't going to do much for that horse. Um, but theoretically, if you have a horse that has that asymmetry and has that high, low problem, those are the ones that I think we're going to see that improvement on. And based on peer reviewed data, that's about 65% of our population. And would you hypothesize that if this was a 60 day, 90 day trial that you would see additional soul growth? Yeah, I've learned not to get myself into that trouble. <laughs> I've learned just to be like, you know what, this is the data, take with it as you will. Um, but like I said at the beginning, I, I'm sure that this is the last thing that MagnaWave people want to hear me say, but this study uh, impressed me enough as somebody that, like one of our commenters said, does not have a ton of extra time, does not have a ton of extra uh, hours in the day to do it. So I think that tells you the answer to your question. Right. Um, and, and interestingly, the funny part of this whole study was that my new upper level horse, who I've always thought was great footed, we've never had the need to x-ray his feet. He's never taken a lame step. He ended up being one of the animals in our poor soul depth, poor Palmer angle group. And so he now stands on this mat before every ride. Great. Ooh. That's I, that, I mean, we could close on that. You said we didn't want to hear it. I was looking for the mute button, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think that was great. Um, Carly, again, we appreciate your time. Martha, we really appreciate your partnership in this, and hopefully it uh, continues. Um, really looking forward to it. Um, and Martha, if you want to say any closing statements, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation as well. Sean, anything from you? I'll let you all go. No, I just I just made sure my information's out there. If anybody has any questions, you know, basically my job is to give enough data to make an educated decision. I'm more than happy to do so. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you, Jason, and your team, and of course Carly, very very much. Uh, again, like you said, for the partnership, I couldn't have said it better. We're thrilled to be able to put this out there. So thank you all. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll uh, just send me the link, and we'll get it out there. We'll email it to everybody in between all these Black Friday emails we start sending out soon. <laughs> all right thank you all very much we appreciate your time thank you